But yeah, I mean, we get out there. I mean, we only caught one fish, but I'm telling you, it was, we were probably more excited and just struck by the fact that we actually pulled uh, an 18 inch rainbow trout through this hole, um, not expecting to catch anything. Welcome to Experiences You Should Have, your how-to guide for amazing experiences. I'm your host, Gail Manasco, and today we are delving into the world of ice fishing with Kevin Uncafer. Now, I have not ice fished before. The closest I've gotten is watching Grumpy Old Men, which is a great movie. And Kevin, however loves ice fishing and Kevin finds these um, obsessions in his life that he discovers and then he delves into whether it's ice fishing, skiing, triathlons, rock climbing, whitewater rafting. So I look forward to having Kevin on uh, again in the future. Maybe we'll do some some more adventure mini episodes with with Kevin or a little mini series but today is about ice fishing. So Kevin hails from Burrell, Pennsylvania, but he is now living in Salt Lake City, Utah. And he discovered ice fishing last year and is here to share this amazing adventure experience. Now, you don't have to live in Utah to experience ice fishing. There's ice fishing spots all over the world. So this episode can be relevant to you depending on where you live. Also, now for my listeners at home who maybe have dry hands because you've been washing your hands a hundred times, go check out soulblends.com. Maggie makes amazing healing salves uh, to bring moisture to your dry skin. Also, starting February 1st, she's going to have amazing uh, kits for sale on her website to help with self-love, um, including candles, bath bombs, body oil, um, a lavender and cedar smoke stick. Go check them out. You can use the promotion code EYSH for 10% off your order. So go check out Soul Blends. They can help you out this winter and beyond, whether it comes to self-love or healing some cracked hands and more. Now on to the episode on ice fishing with Kevin Uncafer. Well, welcome, Kevin, to Experiences That You Should Have podcast. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yes, I'm just curious, how did you get into ice fishing? Um, well, I got into it surprisingly only since last year. Um, I had moved out west from... Pittsburgh PA area, which didn't have any ice fishing out there. Didn't grow up doing it. Um, like a lot of people, uh, in the hard water angling community, um, may have grown up doing it, especially if you're from like the Midwest area, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, those areas, Michigan. Um, I mean, I didn't grow up doing it. So I moved out West specifically for ice fishing, but uh, I would drive up like the Canyon roads and come across these reservoirs and I'd see these tents like out on the water. Um, and I had an idea, you know, it was the ice fishing crews that were out there, but it was never th something that I was specifically drawn to. Um, definitely piqued my interest a little bit. Um, but I got into it actually with, uh, the company that I work for now. Um, we take, you know, high school age kids out on, we essentially are like year round guides taking kids, like high school age kids out. Um, and we just follow the seasons and whatever activities can be done through those seasons, we're taking those kids out to do. And in the winter time, I wanted to, you know, do something different that we haven't done before with the program. And I had noticed some ice fishing equipment laying around our gear shed. Um, 
And I was like, you know what? I'm going to kind of try and get the hang of it this year. The, the, this was last winter. I'm saying this, you know, I was like, I'm going to try and get the hang of this <laughs> thing and, um, you know, be able to go out and take our kids out to do this. And if you've ever taken teenagers out fishing, for the most part, especially if they're beginners, they want to drop their line in and catch something immediately. And ice fishing tends to have that. Um, you, you talk about ice fishing or say ice fishing and you picture, um, you know, this guy sitting on a bucket out on in the middle of a reservoir, freezing their butt off, not catching a single fish. <laughs> and so, you know, I didn't want to go out there having our kids kind of experience necessarily that, you know, teach them that patience, but, um, you know, gain that knowledge that I knew I was going to have to get through. It's, it's, not, it's definitely different than open water fishing. Um, mm -hmm. And so last, last winter, I kind of, you know, brought that gear out, what we had. I bought some new stuff um, to take with me, just doing some research online about things that you should probably have uh, when you're going ice fishing. And so I picked up a couple of things and uh, me and my brother on our first outing went up to this reservoir um, and didn't expect anything. I mean, really, you're just, it, it really hits you when you go out there on the reservoir. Notice it's a whole, you know, it's all frozen over. And then all of a sudden you punch your first hole with your auger and you're looking down at the hole you punch and you're just like, okay, like I, you know, a fish is basically going to have to be down there or swim by right underneath this hole for me to catch anything. And so we didn't have like high expectations on <laughs> catching anything, just kind of wanted to go out, figure it out, talk to a lot of people that we, we saw out on the ice, um, kind of get their take on how things were going, um, what they might be using tactics, whatever. Um, and, you know, for the most part, everybody that we talk to is super open and, you know, super friendly. I mean, there's this like idea that, people that fish hunt whatever you might keep tight to your your spots that you're fishing and you might not say if you're doing good or what you're using and kind of like uptight keeping that little hidey hole for yourself um i mean if that's the if that's true it might be true in other areas but from my experience like all the different reservoirs going around in utah anybody you talk to including myself like people come up to me it's super, it's a very open community. People are very willing to share that information, which is super helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, we get out there. I mean, we only caught one fish, but I'm telling you, it was the, I was probably, we were probably more excited and just stuck, you know, just struck by the fact that we actually pulled uh, an 18 inch rainbow trout through this hole, um, not expecting to catch anything. Um, and so, yeah. And then the second we caught that fish, it just was like, a, a, you know, a spark igniting a flame. And for me, I, I get myself caught up in these passions, you know, obsessions. I like fully commit to things and I will dive in head first. And sometimes they stick around and sometimes I'll do them like year in and year out. Um, but other times they come in waves and they'll kind of phase in and out. And I might do something for a little bit and then it peters out and I don't do it for, you know, either ever again, or it might be a couple of years before I pick it up again. Um, but I think, you know, for me, I think ice fishing is definitely one of those obsessions that I've picked up that is definitely going to be sticking. I love how you say these, like the word obsession. And I think that's so healthy to find something, go deep at it, really learn it. Um, and then stick with it or, or pick it back up again in the future. Um, that's something I've done in my own life. And, and I love that you're kind of after finding these obsessions throughout your life. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it definitely for me at times can be costly in the bank account in the bank department. Cause I can't, cause, <laughs> cause if I, yeah, if I'm, if I'm wanting to get into it again, like if I'm like, I think I love this and, and I just, typically dive straight in. I'm always looking up like the top notch stuff, what I need to have, um, the mm -hmm. clothing, you know, you need to look the part, you know, that's just in my own head. That's just how I typically tend to run things. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, I totally agree with you. Like find these things that you can, you know, become obsessed with and you know, it, it, it 
it, I find it, I, it occupies my thoughts at times um, when I'm driving home from work. Um, you know, I might be just, uh, all I could think about is ice fishing or, you know, climbing or skiing, whitewater, whatever it is. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a super healthy thing. I mean, it gets me outside. Uh, I drag my friends out, which I often, which oftentimes leads them into um, becoming absolutely obsessed with, uh, you know, the things that I'm getting involved in as well. Um, you need to just create this community of, of people that you can go out and year round, um, you know, find these things to become excited about you know, by the tail end of one activity, you're already looking forward to the start of the next. I, I love that. And it sounds like we're going to have a bit of a, a mini series with, with Kevin, you, <laughs> <laughs> because you found all these various obsessions and I want to learn about those favorite obsessions and where to do them. Um, and then spread those to our listeners. So listeners, stay tuned because we're going to be hearing more from Kevin here. So you found ice fishing. You caught that 18-inch rainbow trout. And then did you just immediately just start doing it? Did you start going every weekend? Did you just start buying equipment? Like wh what happened next? Yeah, I would say um, when it came to, well, with that, that first outing that we went on, uh, me and my brother, I had done a bunch of research on, you know, the ice fishing gear, what we should get. Um, we had some hand drill um, augers like at work that we had uh, at my, you know, the place that I work at, I'm fortunate enough that we have a lot of gear at disposal that I'm able to, to also use in my free time. And so I was mm -hmm. able to bring the ice rods that we had at work. I was able to bring the augers that we had at work. Um, the only thing that I ended up picking up bef even before our outing um, was a ice shack, like one of those, you know, ice tents that you see popped up on reservoirs. If you're around a reservoir or lake or whatever, where there's ice fishing accessible, you'll typically, for the most part, if they're not sitting on a bucket, they're in a tent on a bucket probably, <laughs> or, you know, some chair, but, I bought um, a Eskimo fat fish. It was like the biggest tent I could get. I knew I was taking kids out to go ice fish. And so I got the biggest one that I could. It was like a nine person tent. I think it's like 108 square foot um, insulated shack. And um, yeah, caught the fish. And, um, you know, that, that moment of like the, you know, holy crap, like I can't, it was just amazing. Like going out with like little expectations, hoping we were going to catch something, but being okay if we didn't, like it was like, all right, like this makes sense, especially after going out and you kind of drill your first hole. I went out last year with no previous knowledge or really digging into research on, um, on fish and their patterns, the movement, um, barometric pressures, high, low pressure systems, like all this stuff. Um, just went out and was just kind of winging it. it was like oh this seems like a good spot I'll just punch a hole here and we'll see what, you see what happens and after catching that fish it was just like holy crap like that was unbelievable and we kind of you know were winging it and didn't necessarily plan on anything imagine if we had more knowledge and uh, a better idea of how to grasp this and um, and so yeah I would say every single weekend after that for the rest of the winter clear into march we were going out ice fishing and i absolutely love yeah, that yeah catching into them getting on them i mean we were we were stacking up so i i definitely have moved more into a um subsistence living where i'm i i would rather my meat products that i'm eating come from my own will like i go out and harvest and catch and gather you know w what i'm consuming um and so this was like another level to that to where it was like in the winter time sometimes people are like oh winter's here like you know we're moving into skiing and snowboarding or like if you're into the big hunting and fishing you know trapping's a big thing um i, I haven't done any trapping yet something i'm looking to get into um but yeah, it was like another way that I could bring, you know, 
fish home that we could, you know, harvest and eat. And that's, you know, primarily the way that I like to, that I like to go and fish. You know, I, I respect and totally understand people that go out, catch and release. Um, and I do that myself, but I definitely am more on that side of catch and keep. And I'm, key, you know, in those limitations that whatever state you live in, um, you know, in those mm-hmm. regulations, but mm-hmm. yeah, definitely, especially if there's those limitations, there's reason for that, those bag limits and the, the catch limits on fish is the, you know, DNR, DWR out here in Utah, they set those regulations, um, because there's a harvestable amount to create the most ideal, um, ecosystem under, under that ice or in the water, you know? And so, um, if, if they have that limit out there, I'm definitely, if I catch that limit, I'm definitely going to be keeping, um, yeah, keeping my catch. Yeah. And where exactly were you ice fishing or where do you ice fish now? Uh, so that very first time that I went out, we were up at this reservoir called East Canyon. Um, and that was honestly, it, it was one of those spots. It was like a, um, it was like a safety net almost to where we went up there, caught just that one fish the one day and, you know, having no experience ice fishing before it was like, Holy crap. Okay. We caught that one there. Like there has to be some other ones around. We're going to go there again. And it was a spot up at East Canyon that we were hitting, you know, almost every single weekend. And we were pulling out limits of, you know, per, great eater trouts. And so I was taking the kids up there. It was like a spot that I knew we were going to get on to fish. Kids were going to be catching fish. It was going to be exciting for them. They weren't just going to be that classic sitting on a bucket, you know, freezing, not catching anything um, kind of a <laughs> thing. So, you know, wanting them to be engaged. And so, it was a spot that we, we hit up a lot last year. And I, we got into it a little bit later in the season. I say we, we probably started the ice fishing like late January and then fished it out until early March. Um, really, mm-hmm. last year, again, was my very, very first year ever ice fishing, um, having, being exposed to ice fishing. And, and so we, I mean, we stuck to East Canyon Reservoir that whole season towards the tail end, we moved to another reservoir called Pine View. Um, and we ended up doing extremely well over there is with, um, catching perch, which is a different species. It's a smaller, it's a pan fish. Um, and just to put into perspective, like, you know, all these reservoirs have different regulations on which fish you can, keep which fish you have to put back or which you have to kill immediately some of these fish are illegally introduced and could be invasive and harmful to the whole ecosystem in the water and and so you have to definitely follow those regulations um whatever reservoir they differ from reservoir to wet reservoir even within the states and state by state things are different so wherever you're living i don't know where your listeners are they typically up in Bend, like the Oregon Pacific Northwest. Oh no, they're they're all over the world. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, they're wow. yes, they they probably don't know where East Canyon yeah, Reservoir is, yeah. but that's it's near Salt Lake City, Utah, right? Yeah, so it's northeast of um, Salt Lake City. Primarily, a lot of these reservoirs that I've been fishing at are east of Salt Lake, either north or south. Um, yeah, and. But yeah, so each reservoir, each state, country, whatever, you, they'll have different regulations, I'm guessing, on, um, you know, the, the, the fish species, your bag limit that you could keep, harvesting mm-hmm. and keeping um, fish. Um, but for instance, like when we go to East Canyon, our, our, um, our bag limit on trout is four trout per person per day. Um, when you go to Pine View, a fish like a perch, those panfish, um, they produce. If you if you ever go uh, fishing for uh, perch, the majority your bigger size perch, a lot of these fish will have. If you if you harvest them and you you know go home clean the fish, when you're cleaning that fish, you'll pull out this egg sack that has probably thousands of eggs in it, um, and so these fish are reproducing it you know, exponential rates to where, 
these, some of these reservoirs have in the double digit millions of these perch and they want them more down to that one, 2 million range. Um, so they'll put on like ice fishing tournaments. Um, this, this reservoir down south of Salt Lake called Fish Lake, they put on a perch fishing tournament specifically to target perch. And they do all these different, you know, prizes, youth, um, youth, the youth category, like first to 50. So the, that bag limit for perch is 50 individual 50 perch per person per day and so i had uh uh, my brother-in-law um flew out from pittsburgh and we went out specifically to go up to pineview to catch some perch and we were going out with four of us me my wife my brother and my brother-in-law and we were on a on a mission to catch our limits like all four of us 50 fish each of us um and we came out with that limit. And I'll tell you, it was definitely exciting until we got home and we're in the cleaning process of about, you know, 80 fish. And we still had, you know, however many left of that 150. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, they, they set those regulations and those limits for reasons to better that habitat. And they, they, it's a super dynamic environment um, with those fish and game laws. Um which is why typically it stays similar, but it could change and why it's different from state to state um, reservoir to reservoir, because you have different species in different reservoirs and um, different illegally introduced species. And so, yeah, I mean, definitely mm-hmm. the internet, it is a you know huge resource. And that's what drew me to East Canyon, that first trip that me and my brother took out. Um, I went on to the internet and I just typed in Utah, um, uh, fish report. And it brings me to this website that has, it pops up all the reservoirs, streams, rivers around, and it actually has reports on like how the fishing is. And it, it, it varies. You could hit it to where the report was a day old, or you could hit it, you know, you go in and you're looking and it could be two weeks old or three weeks old, but the, fishing game they do do a great job at going to these reservoirs and they'll talk to anglers or they'll go out and fish themselves and um, they'll give a report on how that reservoir is um, specifically with ice fishing they'll also give a um, give you a, a a range of how thick the ice is um, that way you could plan because a lot of some of these reservoirs aren't the closest to drive to so you don't want to drive an hour out there and find out the ice is not even not there or it's just unsafe too thin um and so they do a super great job at updating that to um you know make the most out of those days yeah so for our listeners who who may not make it to utah and they want to find ice fishing near them how can they find a good ice fishing spot I would say it depends. Yeah. Depending on where you live. Um, if you're, if you're in the Midwest, um, you know, you you probably, you have so much access out there, but I mean, driving around, if you ever see those tents, you see people out on ponds, reservoirs, lakes, I would definitely say that that's primarily a spot people go ice fishing. And if you go online to whatever state you're in, um, you know, like I did, I, I really didn't know necessarily. I, I, I saw the shacks out there and I saw people were ice fishing. So like, okay, ice fishing is definitely mm-hmm. a thing out here. Um, and so just going online and typing in your state and if there is ice fishing, you know, you could research it on YouTube. A lot of people, um, a lot of even local people, um, here in Utah and all over the country, all over the world. Um, you know, if you go on YouTube, especially like there are a lot of ice fishing, there's a lot of ice fishing content out there online. And you might be surprised to find out that locally around where you, where you live, there might be, um, you know, an abundant of ice fishing opportunity around you. Um, so yeah, definitely online, just, you know, typing in your state, wherever you live, whatever ice fishing, um, ice fishing report or fishing report. 
and typically yeah, things will pull up either it'll pull up videos from those areas or it might be to like a fishing game website for where you live um, and then just kind of navigate from mm -hmm. there yeah fantastic now you mentioned barometric pressure earlier yeah what what is a good barometric pressure for ice fishing? Uh, I don't know the exact science behind it, but I do know that that higher pressure, um, so like high pressure weather systems that kind of it, it can move in, tends to slow your bite down. So those fish, even even ice fishing under the ice, seem to be impacted by that high pressure system. Um, so that's like super geeking out. I'm not saying that you could go out that you would go out on a high pressure day and you know you, you could probably still catch fish i'm not not saying like you wouldn't ever catch fish if you go out on those days but it it tends to be that when there are those high pressure systems um your like the bite definitely slows down those fish are way less active and that same 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 rules apply and this is just research just me kind of geeking out wanting to try and best my odds when i go out ice fishing um, but yeah. like pre, pre and post spawn. So like when fish are spawning, mating, um, that pre spawn and post spawn tend to be higher activity. Those fish are tending to, um, feed more aggressively and more and during the spawn slowed down. So that's just, if you're specifically necessarily targeting fish that you're wanting to go after, mm -hmm. um, and having your odds, knowing their spawning season, if it's the pre or post spawn could better your odds mm -hmm. and that high pressure. Now, what about time of day? Are, do you ever go out at night or, um, is like early morning better? Oh yeah. Um, that is something that year Kevin would not have known, but this year, <laughs> um, yeah, the, I would say, um, generally, that early morning getting out setting up um before that sun comes up that early morning bite anywhere between right before sunrise to you know maybe 10 10 o'clock 11 a.m that's a really good biting window i've caught plenty of fish through the gap where you know it might be um 11 to three or four in the afternoon I've had really great days fishing then too. Um, but then also in the evening, right at sunset, those times, especially if you're targeting like walleye, um, walleye, or if you're um, also fishing, this is a new fish. I haven't even caught one yet. And I'm already talking about how to fish for them. Um, <laughs> uh, but a burbot, a burbot, or there's so many different names for this fish. Um, the lawyer, uh, they also call it poor man's lobster due to the taste or texture. Um, they say that it has similar texture and taste to lobster, but I'm going out actually in not this weekend, the weekend after the very end of Feb or uh, January um, for the burbot bash up at flaming gorge. I'll be going up there with three other people. We have a team um, that we entered into this burbot fishing tournament um, up there. And it, it's a reservoir gigantic reservoir it splits between it's primarily in wyoming and it also drops down into utah as well um but yeah each year they've been doing a, a burbot bash to go again this is an invasive species that was introduced to this area and it's impacting the uh, kokanee salmon and smallmouth bass fishery in a negative way and they're wanting to if you if you're ever fishing at Flaming Gorge, those burbot when you catch them, you have to kill them. It's not a catch and release kind of a thing. Uh, but this burbot mm. bash is you know to bring anglers from all over um, to this reservoir, and they have some amazing prizes. But yeah, so we're going to be going up there in a couple of weeks for this bash um, and camping out on the ice for a couple of days. Um, and these fish are nocturnal, so these fish feed primarily. Um, at that dusk period and you could catch them clear into the middle of the night. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's dependent on what you want to go catch, what you're fishing for and, um, when is the best time to do it, you know? So for burbot, it would be that evening to dusk into the middle of the night for those. Um, and so other fish, um, for instance, like perch, that bite tends to stop 
when that sun goes down. So after that mm-hmm. sun goes down and it starts to get dark, those perch just, you're not going to, you can catch them all day. You'll catch them one after the next. And then that sun goes down, it gets dark. And then you won't catch another one the rest of the night. So it's very mm-hmm. like species specific um, on when is the best time. But I would say like just a generalization would be like early morning to uh, late afternoon into the evening. Um, you have your like, prime time windows fabulous okay so let's really break down the how to ice fish Mm -hmm. you know what type of gear do you need and take us through the steps for someone who's never done it before yeah so i would say um with your very basic first time ice fisher going out. And this was me last year again. Um, I had some, I had some resources that I was able to utilize, um, which was super nice. And, you know, having just some ice fishing poles, um, buckets that they were carried in and then uh, hand drill augers. That was, that was what I necessarily, that was what I had in the beginning. I bought that tent. But I would say just like the very basics, if you're looking to maybe dabble in it and see if it's something that you want to get into, um, first off would be definitely your, your clothing, your gear that you, you have that you're wearing. Um, if you, if you ski or snowboard, you know, that gear is ideal. That's perfect. It's, um, you know, it tends to be more waterproof or water resistant, windproof, um, insulated nice and warm and that's like the ideal kind of clothing stuff that you're going to be wearing when you're ice fishing now they make obviously they make specific suits for ice fishing that will have like um you know thicker knee capped areas like on these ice fishing suits because sometimes you'll be down on your knees when you're ice fishing right out of the hole um but yeah if you just have like your basic winter gear thermals layering up hand warmers um that stuff you could get away with having a five gallon bucket um if you if this is just the individual person going out fishing a five gallon bucket a if you want you just one single ice fishing rod which you could purchase at you know depending on where you live your cabela's sportsman's um, online amazon uh you could purchase Mm -hmm. them relatively cheap Uh, I would say like a top end, higher expensive, like a cheaper, a cheaper ice fishing rod could run you like 12 to 15 bucks rod and reel Mm -hmm. ready to go. Okay. Uh, And then your upper end ice fishing poles may cost into that 200, 250, depending on your reel, especially um, to 250 range. Um, But yeah, so you could buy cheaper rods, which is what we started with, which is what we caught all of our trout with last year. They were probably $14 rods, um, you know, just rigged up with regular um, fishing line. And so you could get one single rod, reel that up with a spool of, I would suggest doing some sort of a clear, um, depending on what you're fishing for, you know, that would vary on what pound test you're using. if you're fishing for those bigger fish, maybe go with like a braided line and you could either do a uni knot to a fluorocarbon leader or tie your braided line to like a barrel swivel and then tie your fluorocarbon off of that. And so the braided line is like a, this is if you're fishing fish that might be line shy, that might detect that and might deter them from going after your bait. If they see like your braided line attached to whatever you have out as bait, um, and so what the barrel, what a barrel swivel is, or if you tie a uni knot, it's essentially attaching, um, your floral carbon leader, which is a transparent, um, less noticeable line that the fish might not detect. Um, mm-hmm. and so if, they, if you're going for heavier fish, um, that seems to be the way to go. Having like that braided line attached to a floral carbon leader to your uh, bait. Um, but um, yeah, so fishing line, fishing pole, a five gallon bucket. And 
this will depend on how physically fit you are and how determined you are to go ice fishing, whether you go out with like an ax or just a spud bar. If you have it laying around your garage, you could bust a hole through that way. Um, if not, if you'd rather it be a lot easier and you pay a little bit of money, um, having an auger, either a hand crank auger, or they have augers that the bit attaches to like a drill bit. Um, and you could drill it that way, or they have like gas powered electric augers, which are more on the upper price range of those, um, of the augers. And so if it's something that you're kind of dabbling with, if that's the most annoying thing to you, when you go out, maybe your first time and you went out there with an ax and just hacked a hole in the ice and you were most upset with that part of the experience, I would definitely say invest in, um, you know, invest in either a hand crank auger, one of those drill attachment augers or um, an electric or gas auger. Um, mm -hmm. But that, and then just whatever bait, whatever bait you need, but that's, that's all you need. That would be a very simple setup. The, the, the rod and reel line on it, some bait, a five gallon bucket auger or whatever you want to punch a hole through the ice with. Um, and that would be it. And that would be ideally on a nice clear day. You wouldn't want to go out there with that in like 15 mile an hour gusting blizzard like conditions. Yeah. So you, you cut your hole with your mm -hmm. auger or, or an ax or whatever you got, you, you've yeah. got your rod, you've got your bait, you got your bucket and, and you're just, Putting your line in and waiting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're doing it that way to where you don't have any additional tools in your belt to, to, to whip out, um, that would kind of be it. If you are an angler, if you are a fisherman or a fisherwoman, whatever you want to call it, if you fish mm -hmm. year, you know, in the open water season, you might have some spots that you've hit fish. You've had some hot spots on fish already. A lot of people do this too, where they transition from open water to winter fishing. And mm -hmm. when they're trolling around on their boat, if they've got like a Garmin or whatever um, sort of fish finder on their boat, they might mark waypoints of like hot spots or map out a lake or reservoir to find those contours and um, maybe areas that will hold fish. Um, they might, they might spot lock those and you can go back to those in the winter time and punch a hole and be, you know, fishing on a great spot rather than kind of just wandering out there on the ice randomly, um, mm -hmm. and just punching a hole and dropping your line in and hoping for the best. Um, yeah, so it's, it's one of those things I would say Google maps is a big, it's a big resource that I use. Um, and I know a lot of people, especially in the, um, in the Midwest up in Canada as well, Google maps gives a great topographical layout of like a lake or reservoir that you might be interested in going to ice fish. And it will give you, it could, it could show you kind of clear depictions of, you know, steep drop-offs, rocky banks, rocky, you know, rocky areas that might hold fish or, um, you know, it just gives you a good layout of what that reservoir or lake or whatever looks like from above. And you could go on then on your phone or I typically just go on my phone. If I'm on Google Maps, I'll just go on my phone and I'll actually just pinpoint areas that I would like to go try that look like good habitat for whatever fish I'm going for. Um, and then, yeah, mm. I'm able to go out to whatever put in area and make my way directly to that point that I laid out. And so I'm not wasting time driving up to the reservoir and then like, um, getting there and being like, okay, there's a lot of ice here. The whole reservoir is frozen over, you know, where do I go? And so it just gives mm -hmm. me, it gives me a nice clear, um, a clear depiction of like, all right, I'm getting to the reservoir. I want to enter on the east or west or north or southern side. And that's going to be my quickest access to that point that I dropped. Now, what about the thickness of the ice? Like, I would be worried about falling in, you know, a frozen lake and, yeah. and dying a slow death. Yep. That is a, um, 
that is definitely always the first, like first time people are going ice fishing, even my first time going ice fishing, um, you know, just doing some research um, on it before, obviously. You'll hear a lot of different things um, from people, but I would say generally the recommended like thickness of ice that's safe to fish on for you, like as an individual going out ice fishing would be four inches of like clear black ice. And you can tell that by like, if you're ever going to a reservoir that you're not sure of, you could even go out with like an ax or a spud bar as well. Um, but if you go to a reservoir, this is primarily, I would say early season, this is going to be a problem for you. Those early season ice angle, hard water anglers where they're going out and this is like a knowing thing of like, okay, the ice might not be thick, um, but it might not be thick enough to fish on kind of gauging it that way. When you get later into the season, especially if you're in like ice fishing areas, like if you're in the, if you're in, um, the, the Midwest here in Utah, even, uh, and I'm sure up in the Pacific Northwest area, anywhere North of Salt Lake, um, when you get later into that season, like late January to late February, um, it, this is, it's not to say just go walk out there, but, um, it, that, that worry about thin ice is typically going to be early in the season and late in the season. So when that ice is thinning out towards the tail end of the season to the very beginning where it's just forming, but yeah, they say generally mm -hmm. four inches of nice, clear, black ice is what you're looking for and that is that's safe ice to fish on and they always say you know no ice is safe ice so those the ice depths can kind of change as well um depending on the vegetation and the reservoir the temperatures um that happen wherever you live like week in and week out um and so if you're like around the banks like big thick like um uh what are those things called cottontail um like high weeded brushed area around the edges um typically are very weak spots to enter i wouldn't want to go enter in a reservoir or a lake in that spot um typically it tends to stay insulated and that ice is thinner and weaker in those spots um, a lot of reservoirs and lakes though, you know, just from people being out on boats or kayaks, whatever, they'll have like a boat entry, like a boat launch area. And a lot of the times those areas are great areas to, um, go out from, um, to enter onto the water. If you go out and you see lots of sled marks, or, um, if you're later in the season, you see people out there on snowmobiles, Polaris razors, um, quads, you know, different things like that, you know, generally for me, just like, okay. Like these people are out here driving around. It probably is okay. And I see all these sled marks, but if you're like, if you really want to check, you know, it's, it's not, a it's a, it's a good practice to drill holes, um, as you're moving out onto the ice to just consistently be checking that depth, the ice quality itself. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if you're just going out fishing off foot, walking a sled out, um, I would say, yeah, you're, you're going to be grooving with that four inches of, um, good, clear black ice. Um, and then when you get into, if you're in areas that you could take quads and Polaris razors and stuff that ice, the ice thickness tends to go up a couple inches. So, um, that seven, seven to 10 inches. And then above that, um, you know, if you're in that like two foot range of ice, good enough to be driving vehicles out onto, um, mm -hmm. again, depending on where you live and if you're not having, um, spells where you might have two weeks of like warmer weather than you're used to above freezing. Um, you know, if you, as long as you have that four inches of clear black ice, you know, it's, that's a good, that's a good sign. That's, that's good ice to go fish on. Mm -hmm. And whenever you're, whenever you're fishing as well, you might go out there, even, you know, this past weekend when I was out, I was on a relatively noisy reservoir. Um, it sounds like someone 
it freaks people out initially. Um, when you get used to it, it's kind of a, you know, music to your ears kind of a sound to where if you if I'm out there drilling, I drill like nine inches of clear black ice. I'm on good ice. I'm not worried at all. This ice is not, I'm not going to go falling through this ice. Um, and then you'll be out there fishing. You might be in your tent on your bucket, whatever. And all of a sudden you hear this sound. It sounds like someone shaking like a sheet of metal, you know, like a thin sheet of like a, uh, like metal, this rebounding mm-hmm. kind of a sound. You might even feel mm-hmm. a little vibration and the ice is actually, the ice is actually like, um, it's, it's shifting and cracking. And initially, you know, everyone kind of freaks out of like, this is it. Like we're going through. Um, and that's actually, you know, again, like if I'm, if I'm out there and I have good ice and I hear those sounds, that's to me is like this, this reservoir is moving. It's shifting. That ice is naturally cracking, but those cracks are getting filled with more and more ice. That reservoir is building thicker layer. We're building on more ice. Um, okay. And especially if those temperatures are good. So that's music to our ears um when those conditions are good yeah yeah again oh, early okay. early ice when you're getting into that like you know when you're fishing on like three like two to three inches of ice and mm-hmm. if you're hearing cracks then and it's like a sunny warm day out i don't know if i'd be very happy about that mm-hmm. uh, um so generally mm-hmm. my rule of thumb um, yeah, I'm going four plus inches, good, clear black ice. Um, and yeah, if you're, if you're worried about it, you know, check in your depths as you go, going out with that safety equipment. Again, they make some, there's some great videos on uh, YouTube ice safety. If you fall through the ice with or without gear, um, good safety protocols. Um, this guy, Aaron Weeb um, with uncut angling, he does a couple videos with falling through the ice. Um, also, yeah, go check his videos out. He has some awesome ice fishing content. Same with uh, Jay Siemens and uh, Clayton Schick with Clayton Schick Outdoors. They put out absolutely amazing ice fishing content um, at like kind of ethics that they have with ice fishing, um, safety, setup, gear. Um, if you're looking to really geek out into it, I would definitely check those guys out. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. Now you've, you've gone out, you've gone ice fishing, you've caught your fish. What are you cooking for dinner? Give me, give me some, I don't know, dinner ideas or a recipe. Yeah. Um, so depending on what you catch, um, obviously is where I would start. So we'll just say, um, I would say majority you know, if you're, if you're catching trout, um, a lot of people like, it, it depends if you like, um, if you like fish to begin with what you can do with it and, um, the quality of those fillets, if you're catching like a big reservoir Brown, those, those fish tend to be, they, they tend to have like a typically like a muddier ish taste. Um, not to say that you can't cook that fish and it'd be absolutely amazing, but they tend to have more of that, um, that, that fishy kind of a taste to it. Um, Mm -hmm. some of the, uh, some of the trout that we catch out here, their fillets will be like this vibrant, um, like pinkish orange, almost salmon esque color to them. Um, those fillets absolutely amazing. Um, you could cook them in the oven. Um, you know, put whatever spices, um, whatever spices you want on it or in it after you got it, um, and put it in the oven and bake it. And when you're baking, when you're baking fish, like my rule of thumb, when you're cooking it, you don't want that fish to be flaking apart when you take it out of the oven. You want well, mm-hmm. like whenever, whenever that fish is done, you want to like take a fork and kind of that fish, that fish fillet has a little bit of a resistance, but will flake when you're taunting it with that fork, you don't want it to come out already flaked out. That's overcooked. Um, Got it. So I do like, I do like purely full fish skin on if I'm going for trout, full fish skin on in the oven, or if you have a smoker in the smoker, smoke trout's absolutely amazing. Um, you mm. can do smoke trout mm-hmm. where you pull that meat off 
and you can mix it into like a cream cheese dip. You could do like a trout dip where that meat, the, the flamey, everything's mixed into a dip. Um, but my all time favorite trout recipe definitely has been trout burgers. Um, and so with that, you're filleting those, you're, you're taking the fillets off of those trout and then just with a knife, just mincing up that meat, um, Mm -hmm. into nice, you know, minced up small chunks and, and then mixing in whatever spices you want, um, I like like paprika, salt, pepper, um, and we use uh, like Parmesan cheese as well, crack an egg into it, mix it all up and form patties out of it. And then just fry it like a burger on, you know, on the grill or, you know, on, on the stove, whatever you want, um, cooking it up that way, put some avocado, whatever on it and have that in burger form. It's absolutely, and that would be like a great rendition that would be a great meal to cook up for somebody who might be um who might be hesitant to try fish or they don't necessarily like a fishy taste um that trout burger ha- i mean revolutionized the game absolutely amazing then if you get into like um some pan fish like perch very similar to a walleye. Uh, if people know what a walleye is, they kind of are this crazy, um, you know, badass looking fish. They got these big eyes. They look kind of mean and scary, but they're probably your most blank slate fish you could cook with besides like um, halibut or I mean tilapia, just white fish. Um, it's like this blank slate and you can really prepare it and that filet will take on the flavors of kind of whatever you cook with. Um, and so you could really customize the way you're cooking those fish with perch, for instance, those smaller pan fish. Um, they also have that very white flaky flesh, a very mild, super mild taste to where you can kind of cook them how you, you can cook them whole skin on everything. Um, or you could fillet them out, um, and do like, you could batter them up and deep fry them or air fry them, bake them in the oven and do like little mini, like, uh, fish tenders, fish sticks, whatever. Um, and, uh, my wife actually started making, she did made these perch cakes. Essentially. It's like a, she took like a crab cake recipe and just put perch in instead of crab. And those were Ooh, yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah. Super, super good. Yeah. So, I mean, just any, yeah, you could just, it depends on what you're catching. Um, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I would say for trout, I mean, trout burgers has been one of my favorite ways to cook it up, um, that and the smoker and then, yeah, just whatever you're catching depends on how you'll, how you'll cook it. All right. I am coming over for dinner after (laughs) this pandemic. (laughs) Yeah. You're welcome. Anytime. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> fabulous <laughs> we will come to utah um <laughs> man this is this is great you already got my mouth watering i just love the idea i've never gone ice fishing but think this would be an amazing experience that you should have well truly uh, thank you for for coming on the show yeah thank you very much for having me uh i'm gonna have more information on the website experiences that you should have.com thank you so much for listening to experiences you should have And hopefully we will get to go out and travel and have amazing experiences as the year turns on. So I am hoping for a brighter 2021. We will we will see what the rest of the year brings. And if you're looking for amazing ideas, maybe you're doing some trip planning for 2022 or later in 2021. Uh, definitely go through, check out some of the older episodes as you're coming up with various bucket list adventures you should have. And we are an experience focused podcast to help you go and experience life because what brings happiness is experiences over things. 
So until our next adventure, I look forward to hearing from you listeners out there about amazing adventures in the world.